Good morning, everyone. Uh, as the offering is being passed around, just want to make you aware of three things. NPC is this coming Saturday for the men at 7 a.m. Uh, Mr. Joe gets donuts. You listen to a message. Um, it is a good time, so we want to encourage you to do that. Also, after service today, we are having a vision presentation of where this church is going to be going into the next five years. We want to encourage you to hang out and listen uh, to what we're going to be doing um, in the next five years. If you're new here this morning, what a great opportunity to kind of figure out what Seven Christian Church is all about. And then finally, we are having a thank you meal for one of our elders, uh, Brother Billy Teal and his wonderful wife, Delora. They're going to be leaving us, going to Ohio. We need you to sign up because spaces are limited. And so there is a sign-up table out in the foyer, and we would love for you to come and, uh, and celebrate this man and his many years of service here. And then finally, today is national, or not today, May 5th is National Prayer uh, Day, Worldwide Prayer Day, where everyone's going to pray. And so we have cards out there in the foyer. What we want you to do is take one card, and we're challenging you to spend 30 minutes in prayer um, this coming uh, prayer day. And so just take a card, and then you can choose which time you want to pray. The objective is, is to have 24 hours of prayer going up that day. So we want to encourage you to do that. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn open to Matthew chapter 18. That's where we're going to be today. And today we're going to be talking about, do children matter to Jesus? And if so, how does that impact the way that we do church? We've been in a family church series, and we're defining our mission statement. Our mission statement is simply this, to be a family church where your life matters. That's who we want to be. That's what we want to be. And we've gone through um, now uh, four sermons talking about what it means to be a family church. The first sermon was titled Family Church. It means to redefine how you view church through the lens of the spirit and not the flesh. That it is your spiritual relationship with Jesus and with each other that defines you being a part of God's family. And that's how we want to view each other. The second sermon was on being a church for all people. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from, whether or not you're churched, unchurched, rechurched. We want anyone and everyone to feel welcome into our family here at SCC. And then third of all, it is a church of dysfunctional people. That in order to be a part of this church, you have to be imperfect. Uh, you have to make mistakes and mess up because we all do that. We all make uh, mistakes and we all mess up. And then today we're talking about a church where children matter. I think children are cool. Uh, children, they make me smile, they make me crack up. I mean, think about it, you know, they'll literally pick their nose in front of you no matter what time of the day. If they got a boogie, they're going to take it out. You know, they're just, they're careless, you know what I mean? If they got a scratch, they're going to itch it. They are brutally honest. I mean, they are brutally honest. You'll be teaching a class, and, and they'll just straight up tell you, this wasn't a very good lesson today, Mr. Rick. <laughs> it is hilarious. Children are, are so fun. Middle, schools, middle schoolers are absolutely hilarious. They're at that stage where they're, they're not cool enough, you know, to where they still want to hang out with you. Um, but at the same time, they're very carefree, and you just what you see is what you get. Um, and I can understand why children matter so much to Jesus. And, you know, our children, unfortunately, arguably... This is probably one of the toughest times that children have ever had uh, to be brought up in. Now, our world and our experience for our children, obviously, they have been exposed to things over the course of history that is terrible. But there's a certain element about our modern digital age that makes life pretty tough for kids. When you think about the fact that pornography exposure happens at an early age of 11, is the average age that a child is exposed to porn, our age of gender identity confusion, where you leave the, the gender up to the child. I mean, think about this. What other major question in a child's life would we just leave it up to them? Well, you can decide whether or not you want to go to school today. I'm going to leave education up to you. You don't want to go to the dentist? Hey, if you want a, a mouthful of rotten teeth, that is your individual right. I want you to have that choice. You don't want to go to the doctor today? That's okay. It's up to you. What do we do with children? We help teach them. We help show them the right way that, belongs to, that they belong to God. And unfortunately, they are raised in a world that gives them a message of confusion rather than clarity. They have an unstable economic future. They're raised in a world where Islamic jihad is worse, arguably, um, than, it's, than it's ever been. They're in an anti-Christian age of intolerance and social persecution and intellectual attacks. If you stand for traditional Christian values, you'll be shouted down, economically sanctioned, and hated. For instance, the bathroom bill that was passed in North Carolina, you've got companies like PayPal and, and other institutions that are holding 
the state hostage. Meanwhile, what people don't understand is that PayPal, for instance, thrives in Saudi Arabia who murders homosexuals. But yet, they will not join a state that has a bathroom, boy that says, bathroom bill that says men should go to men's bathrooms, women should go to women's bathrooms. I honestly don't understand why it's even a discussion. There is a war against the traditional Christian home, and your child is raised in a culture in which war uh, has been waged against them, whether or not we want to accept it. And so with this type of understanding, that's why I believe today children should be more important to the structure of the church now than it's ever been. Jesus opens up this dialogue in Matthew chapter 18, and it really has a foundation of humility. The disciples are arguing, Jesus, who's the greatest? Who's the best person in your kingdom? Who has the highest rank? Who is the most important? And Jesus flat out totally responds to them, the secret to to true greatness is to be serving others. That is the secret to true greatness. Your position in the kingdom of importance and authority starts with humility. And your humility is measured simply by this, your openness and sensitivity to the so-called inferiors of the kingdom, which were children. At that time, you weren't even considered a man. You weren't even allowed to speak in synagogue as a Jewish boy until you were 30 years old. I would not be qualified under the Jewish system to be a man worth uh, speaking to or worth hearing from. And so they had this kind of downgraded view of children. And so Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom, gives this radical perspective and this radical point. And so if you'll follow along with me in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, it should be up on the screen for you. Look what Jesus says here. Uh, Matthew's recording this. And so he says this. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes this lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The first point that we're looking at this morning is the fact that children are great in the eyes of God. And so they're asking Jesus this question. Jesus, what is the hierarchy in your kingdom like? Who is below us? Obviously, since we are your followers, since we are your prime uh, men to to be appointed in your kingdom, we want to know what our position is and who's going to be the greatest. You see, they have this certain messianic expectation that the Messiah would come in with guns blazing on a white stallion and he would slay the Romans and he would overthrow the world and everyone would come to Jerusalem to worship and the Jews would control everything. That's the idea that they had about the Messiah. But yet, Jesus brought something totally different, totally radical than what they actually expected. And this is the unfortunate thing, is that great damage occurs when we enter the kingdom under a false pretense or ignorance. You see, they had this argument because they had a false idea of who Jesus was going to be. They had this argument because they had a false understanding of what the kingdom was like. And this was based off of things like just a simple misunderstanding or an ignorance of of who this Messiah really was going to be. Without the right foundation of what it means to follow Jesus, we will forever build a house on mud and straw. We will forever build a kingdom uh, on mud and straw and storm after storm that hits this congregation or New Testament Christianity will forever fail if we don't have the right understanding of who Jesus is and how his kingdom is set up. Even us as individual Christians or a church body, if we don't get back to the basics of honoring children and having a childlike faith, our kingdom work will forever be in vain. You see, Jesus, when he establishes his kingdom, he doesn't totally do away with rank. In other words, he doesn't totally do away with a system or an organization. What he does is he flips it upside down. If you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. If you want to be on top, you have to serve at the bottom. In fact, in this passage, Mark kind of gives a different perspective. He adds something that Jesus also said. And in Mark 9.35, Jesus said this, If anyone would be first... He must be the last of all or the servant of all. And Jesus wants to clarify with an illustration. That's what I appreciate about Jesus. Even C.S. Lewis, if you ever read any works uh, from C.S. Lewis, he'll make a point 
and then he'll give three or four illustrations to follow along with it. And so I want you to imagine Jesus is teaching his disciples, and they're probably sitting around him in some type of U-shaped fashion. If they were sitting at a table, Jesus would be sitting in the place of honor. So picture like a U, right? And the place of honor um, would be right here as he was teaching his disciples. And so Jesus calls a child into the midst. In other words, he probably calls the child in and places this child at the seat of honor right next to him, right next to the teacher. And I want you to think about what that would mean to the disciples. As they're asking, who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And he points to a little child, and he brings that child in and places that child at the seat of honor. Mark actually also adds this to Matthew's account. It says that when Jesus said this, when you accept this child, you accept me. He actually says that he embraced the child, which which showed a sign of acceptance. And that it would would have spoken loud and clear to the disciples. In order to be the greatest, you got to be like this little child. Angel and I, we like to watch Hallmark Christmas movies. Anybody like to watch Hallmark Christmas movies? Yeah. After a while, you know, they get totally lame. You're like, I can totally predict what's going to happen right now. That, and everything seems to take place in Arizona. I'm like, what is Christmas in the heat? This is ridiculous. All right? You guys already know I'm obsessed with Christmas. It should be in a snowy winter wonderland in my mind. Anyways, I know it's weird. I'm sorry. So, so the Hallmark movie, we were watching this one Hallmark movie, and this one young lady aspired to be a chef, right? And so she went to school, and she was studying to be a chef, and finally she gets hooked up um, with an awesome kitchen, and actually she gets the, 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 the chief chef is actually the one that she, like, dreamed of working with. And when she went to, the, went to um, get a job, she actually entered in as a dishwasher, right? This is, what's, this is what's so funny. She entered in as washing dishes. And so she comes to the meeting, and she gets there late, and of course, the tone's already set. But she's this happy-go-lucky, free type of spirit, you know, not a big deal. And so the chef stares her down and, you know, kind of gives her a dirty look. And she kind of walks through, you know, what the day's going to look like. And then she reminds them of this principle. She asks them, who is the most important person in the kitchen? And do you know what they all respond with? Take a guess. Yes, the dishwasher. The reason is, she said, is because if we don't have dishes, we're not going to be able to do our job. And so she reminded them the most insignificant position in the kitchen is actually the most important. And later on in the show, when she was asked um, by the dishwasher, you know, why, why, why do you say that? She goes, I need to constantly remind my staff to be humble in their service, and to realize that our team is only strong as the weakest link. Albert Einstein said this. He says, I speak to everyone the same way, whether he is the garbage man or the president of a university. Jesus said, unless you become like this child, think about this, unless you become like this child, you cannot enter into the kingdom. Those who are arrogant or selfish or power-grabbing or enjoy personal prestige are blocked from entering into the kingdom. And think about it like this. If you find yourself wanting to make all the decisions in your ministry or as the leader of your family, you may be suffering from an adult heart. If you find yourself trying to push others out and keep your own power or position, you may be suffering from a grown-up heart. If you find yourself disqualifying people from serving in the kingdom over non-biblical qualifications, you may be suffering from a grown-up heart. If you can't say things like, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, you may be suffering from an adult heart. If you find yourself restricting the liberty of others because you yourself find it as a stumbling block, you may be suffering from an adult heart. We must change the way that we do church and the way that we view value and power and authority. And it starts with this, becoming like little children. This shows us the importance of repentance. It reminds me of what Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Unless you too repent, unless you change, you will likewise perish. This is incredible. Unless we change and become like little children... We have no power or authority in God's eyes to do his work. And you have to ask yourself, why are children so great? And I believe the context shows it's because of their nature. They are naturally inferior. They're subordinate to the decision makers. They are the least important in society, as I said, under the Jewish law, under the Jewish idea of what it meant to be a man, they were the least. They are totally dependent and submissive to others. They compare, um, when you think about it, comparing what it means to be a child in contrast with an adult, they have an innate desire to please, 
to please their creator. And Jesus is telling his disciples that unless you have the heart of a servant, the heart of a follower, unless you get this idea of power and authority out of your mind, you have no position in my kingdom. Jesus needed his followers, he needed his disciples to have a certain understanding, a certain idea of what it meant to be a kingdom worker. Because if they were going to change the world, if they were going to make a true impact on their community, they had to radically change their idea of what the kingdom of God was really like. If you want to move forward in the kingdom, you as an individual Christian, you as a person who wants to follow and be a part of God's plan, you first must go back. If you want to be progressive, you first must turn around and go the other way. If you want to move forward in the kingdom, you first must become the last. If we want to be the greatest, we have to be the least. If we as a church want to progress in Severn, if we want to progress in Maryland, if we want to be the greatest church that we can possibly be, we need to become the least. We need to become the servant of all, not just Christians not just people who we believe are qualified. I like what C.S. Lewis said this in Mere Christianity. He said, progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. And if you've taken a wrong turning, then going forward does not get you any nearer. If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. And in that case, the man who turns back the soonest is the most progressive. We have to make a foundation of this church, not only, not just about children, but modeling what that means. It means to serve, to have a servant's heart. And here's your key phrase. If you're following along in your outline, your fill in the blank is simply this. If we want SCC to be great and children to matter here, we must take the fastest route to greatness by becoming a servant of all. You know, if you think about it, the greatest thing that we can do for our children is to show them what it means to be a servant. I've got a multiple choice question for you, right? It should show up here on the screen, and I don't want you to shout out any answers. I just want you to answer in your own mind, all right? So here is a basic question. And this actually, I saw this on Twitter, and it kind of reminded me of my role. It reminds me of my part in the kingdom. Um, And just as a quick interjection, you know, a lot of sermons, they're just about reminding us of what we've already been committed to, not teaching us something new. And look look what my, my question is here for you. Complete the following sentence. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 23, the master replied, well done, thou good and faithful elder. Well done, thou good and faithful evangelist. Well done, thou good and faithful tither. Or well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's servant. And you can place anything. Those are just examples that I gave. Um, Whatever you want to put in those first three, at the end of the day, Jesus calls us to service. And this means humility. Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value one another. Value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So what does this mean? It simply means this. Our first thought should be, how can I serve? You know, it takes a lot of humility to admit that you need help. It takes a lot of humility to admit that you need people to help you serve in your area of ministry. One of the most courageous things that you can do as a ministry leader or as a spouse or as anybody is to admit that you need help, that you need a volunteer or you need a counselor or you need somebody to guide you and direct you in life. And believe me, I know what it's like to be in that tough position to say, I can't be the hero, I need some help, I need some guidance. You see, the only way to move our church forward, the only way for you to move forward is to serve. You know, a lot of people are looking for happiness. A lot of people are looking for fulfillment, gratitude. Uh, A lot of people are looking for self-pleasure. And it's a paradox. It's a catch-22. That the only way to fill your cup is to empty it. The only way to be great in this world is to become the least through the perspective of Jesus. The only way to be a good spouse is not to see how much you can take in, but to see how much you can give out. And that when we find this beautiful um, paradox in the scriptures... That if we want to have the most fulfillment is to empty and give ourselves away, and we feel that nourishment and that satisfaction, that is true New Testament Christianity. What else does this mean to become a servant? 
To be humble. It means that we can't allow our motivations to undermine our actions. You could know theology. You could give money. You could serve the poor. You could even give your body and die as a martyr. But it will all be in vain if your heart isn't right. We can't just do things to do things, but our heart must be in it. And this is one of the biggest things that we need to model to the children of this church, to the teenagers, to the young adults, is that we aren't doing things for the simple reason to do things, but we're doing it because we want to follow God. Our false humility must be crucified. And the higher we rise in the kingdom, the more we shall become like Jesus, even giving up of ourselves. The key word that we're focusing in on here this morning under our first point is humility. Is humility. I've got seven quick principles for you um, to guide you to be a humble person. And they're really practical and they're really easy to understand and they should be up there on the screen for you. The first one is this. What does it mean to be a humble servant? It means don't make yourself great at the expense of other people. You don't need to point out other people's problems in order to make yourself great. As far as a church, we don't need to look at what other churches are doing wrong. We need to focus on Severn Christian Church. So we don't need to point out the mistakes and the tragedies of other people at the expense of them in order to make ourselves great. If you have to hurt people to make yourself great, you've missed the calling of Christ. Number two, don't leave room in your soul for bitterness by clinging onto the injuries of the past. Do not leave room in your soul for bitterness. Bitterness destroys people. It destroys people, and the, the worst thing about it is you don't even know that you're bitter. You can't even see how bitter you are when you cling onto the injuries of the past. The reason, for instance, people might say the reason why I don't serve at church is because so-and-so hurt me many years ago. Clinging on to that injury has now disabled you from kingdom work. Here's number three. Don't be afraid to admit your failures and weaknesses. Be transparent. I mess up. I make mistakes. I can't be the greatest youth minister on the face of this earth. I am not the greatest preacher on the face of this earth. There's a lot that I have to learn about humility, about pride, about sacrifice, about service, about the structure of youth ministry, about how to be a good presenter of the gospel, about studying the New Testament, what it means to be a good dad, what it means to be a good husband. We could be here all day, let's put it like this, if we went through a list of things that I need to improve upon. But it, we must have this idea, we must have this conviction that when we speak and talk with people and lead, we must let our mistakes and our failures be made known. Number four, don't be afraid to dream. Don't be afraid to imagine or be open-minded. This means that you don't think you know it all. When you let other people make decisions, when you let other people lead the way, it shows humility, saying, you know what, I don't have the best ideas. It's not all about me. Number five, don't insist on your own rights and demands. Remove I want and I need from your vocabulary. And number six, don't feel like you're losing when others are winning. This is kind of the toughest part, isn't it? Right? This is really hard. You see people being more successful at their jobs, graduating before you, advancing before you, getting money before you. Success is all around other people and you're moving at the speed of a snail and you're like, what can I do to be better than them? That is at the heart of pride. Hebrews 13.5 says, be content with what you have. I know it said seven, but it's actually six, sorry. Be content with what you have. If we fail as church leaders, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and friends to model the life of service and humility, we are placing a stumbling block between a child and Jesus. If we stand in a child's way of coming to Jesus, we are in direct conflict with him. Here's our second point is that children are connected to Jesus. Children have this weird connection with Jesus. I don't know what it is about children that actually makes them greater in the eyes of God than us. It's probably their innocence and their inability to survive on their own, that God views children as precious, and he takes it very seriously, what happens to a child. Um, now that I'm a dad, you know, I have to really take it seriously how I raise my child and, and how I model the life for her behind closed doors. You know, it's kind of, I won't say it's easy because it's not, but it's different coming to church and modeling for, for the youth ministry of what it's like to live a holy life, but they don't necessarily get to see all of my flaws and all of my shortcomings. And when it's 2.30 a.m. and I'm like, honey, you, you please get up. I'm tired. You know what I mean? This idea of self-sacrifice, Angel will say, you know, Rick doesn't get up to feed the baby. And it's true. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do do that sometimes. You know, try to get on a rotation like once every four to five weeks. Right, Eric? You with me? I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's a tough system. Anyways, 
So we have, to, we have to encourage one another to be humble, to understand that we don't have it all together. It's like this, right? There is a unique connection between Angel and Piper. Um, there's a unique connection between God and children. There's a unique connection. Piper responds differently to Angel than she does me. Um, yeah, I'll make her laugh, I'll make her giggle, but there's a certain amount of comfort. There's a certain amount of nourishment that, that Piper gets from Angel that, that I just can't satisfy. It's, it's, a, it's a connection that can only take place between a mother and her child. Um, another idea is kind of like a grizzly bear, right? A grizzly bear, a, mo- a mother bear, will be ridiculously protective over her, over her cubs. There is a unique bond between a mother bear and between her cubs. Even if you are in the general vicinity, right, you, your life is over. <laughs> your life is over. Which, by the way, with a black bear, you don't respond the same way to a black bear as you do a grizzly bear. A grizzly bear, you're supposed to pretend that you're dead, right? Seriously. You're, you're, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but you're supposed to pretend that you're dead. Maybe the idea is this. When you're around Jesus, pretend that you're dead, right, when you're around children. So here's the deal. I know this makes absolutely no sense, and I apologize for it. So let's keep going through Matthew chapter 18, and look at verse 5. It says this in verse 5. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Not a very pleasant picture of what it means to cause a little one to stumble. He says in verse 7, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Loud and clear, those who are confusing children over their gender identity and their eternal salvation will have hell to pay. Woe to them who are causing little children to reject their innocence and their unique connection with God. There will be hell to pay, especially to the parents. He says this, Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they may come. If your hand causes, uh, or if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for your life to be maimed or crippled than for you to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Verse 9, and if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Quick interjection here, okay? This, this is, Jesus isn't being absolutely literal here. For instance, if you struggle with pornography, you know, poke those eyes out because that way you won't sin. That's not what he's saying. The idea behind this is simply this. When it comes to things in our life that come between us and Jesus, it's better to lose those things than to lose your soul. If your job or your sports or your family or whatever it is is coming between you and following Jesus, it's better to suffer by letting those things go than for your body, than for your soul to be thrown into hell. Not that you literally must remove parts of your body, right? But focusing here on verse 10, here's what he says. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. This is pretty radical. This is pretty awesome. This, this unique, wonderful connection between God and his children. You know, the, the worst thing that we can do for our children is to teach them entitlement. This is my right. God's going to have to deal with my life and how I choose to live because it lays a stumbling block before them and it's the worst sin of all, which is the sin of pride, that you get to choose, that you get to demand, that you are the ruler of your life, that this is your money, these are your things. It is a sense of entitlement. Entitlement says this, you deserve to put these things above following Jesus, whether it's sleeping in or sports or school or friends or overnighters, whatever it is that we are putting before Jesus for a child to have to jump over is a stumbling block. You know, when we would have family visits, one of my most special, unique memories is getting together at my grandparents' house and having the whole family in, whether it was around a holiday or just a fun weekend. We would stay up all night and play cards. We would eat ourselves sick. We would get Donald's Donuts. You don't know anything about donuts until you have Donald's Donuts from Zanesville, Ohio. If you ever go through Zanesville, Ohio, please do yourself a favor and stop at Donald's Donuts, right? It's an old mom and pop shop. It blows maple donuts, duck donuts, Donald's Donuts, whatever, uh, well, Donald's Donuts. It blows all the other donut shops out of the water. It is absolutely delicious. And we eat ourselves sick. My favorite are the Long John's, the maple creams. Maple on the outside, cream on the inside. Oh, my goodness. Wow. All right, incredible. I'm telling you, incredible. Anyways, 
We would eat ourselves sick and play cards and have so much fun. And, you know, I, I'm a younger man at this point, and so my grasp on Christianity isn't, isn't total, right? It isn't absolutely qualified. And my family, for the most part, was a good Christian family. Rarely did we ever miss church as far as Sunday morning attendance was concerned. And I was taught and raised in a New Testament church. But here's the thing. Whenever we would have these family get-togethers, uh, because we would stay up so late and have so much fun on Saturday and on Friday, uh, we would skip church on Sunday and just, and just hang out. In fact, if I were to be totally honest with you, rarely did we break bread or read our Bibles. We didn't do those things. And it actually communicated a subconscious message to me that to me, Jesus became important as long as it didn't cause me inconvenience. And so when it came to things like Saturday night fun, I would play poker with the guys or being involved in football or whatever it was, these priorities took was more important than being at church on Sunday or following after Jesus. When I was in football, football season, Monday through Saturday, yes, we didn't have football on Sunday, but after all, I need a break, right? I mean, God surely understands if I can't make the church. Look at all the sports activities that I'm involved in. Too much schoolwork? Just skip. God will definitely understand if I can't make it because being a good student is important to God after all, right? It created this message, this stumbling block in my mind that I was entitled and that these things belonged to me and I didn't belong to Jesus. Unconsciously, my family was communicating a message to me that caused me to be disconnected with God. The word stumble actually means this, to bait, to trap, to allure an unsuspecting and ensnare them. Harold Fowler writes this, In context, it means to have no regard for others by refusing to adapt ourselves to their intellectual ignorance or inconsistencies. I was reading an article, unfortunately it was written by a Restoration Church uh, guy, who I won't, I'm, I'm not going to tell you who because that's not important. Anyways, the main idea was this, that churches are wrong if they have We Worship or Junior Church or Kids Connection. That if your children, infant all the way up through 18, aren't sitting with you in the auditorium, then that means you're not doing things wrong. The reason basically was, is because children need to see their father in church. And I'm sitting there reading this article, and I'm so discouraged uh, because children need to see their father model faith Monday through Saturday, not just Sunday. Children need to see their parents, they need to see their older brothers and sisters showing what it means to be a follower of Jesus outside of the one hour of worship. Number two, your children would have absolutely no understanding or idea of what I'm talking about right now. In fact, I don't know if there's any sitting in here right now, but most likely your child is probably coloring, playing on their phone, sleeping just like I did. <laughs> I was raised in this type of church. Don't get me wrong. I know what it's like not to have kids' church and to have to sit there and listen to a really boring preacher, and you're like, dude, is he over yet? <laughs> we actually, there was this light system at the last church that I was at, and the kids had to sit in there on Sunday night, and you would see the kids get up on the seats and look up to the red, green, or yellow light, and they'd be like, okay, we're almost done. It's yellow now. I mean, kids just don't understand what we're preaching on and what we're teaching. We have to meet them at the level that they're at, right? And so I, I slowly went from discouraged to encouraged by the fact that we are doing things right, and then I saw that the article was republished from 1980, and I'm like, Pfft. No wonder, you know, you got to go back to the 80s in order to find any document that would write something like that. If you do any research at all, if you have any experience in children's ministry or early childhood development, you will know that a kid's church or kid's classes are, are the best thing for them. Getting on their level, you will have more growth, more understanding, meeting them where they are at than just forcing them to sit in here and listen to somebody like me. Here's why it's important, right? Remember what Harold said. To be a stumbling block means to have no regard for others by refusing to adapt ourselves to their ignorance or their inconsistencies. We have to, if we're going to be a church where children matter, we have to meet them where they're at. Another idea of to stumble means this, to make life, a life that is holy and useful to God more difficult than it already is. It's to take things in the New Testament farther than they need to go. It's to say, here's God's word, but I'm going to create all this extra stuff around it because I want to make sure that they honor what the Bible says. And that's just simply false. James says this in Acts chapter 15, verse 19. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't make being a follower of Jesus more difficult than it already is. Jesus is telling them, 
Limit your freedoms so you don't shock the conscience of these little ones. Don't give them a warped, institutional, American, traditional view of who Jesus is because it will turn them away every time. Let the Bible speak where the Bible speaks. He also says don't despise these children, right? Don't cause them to stumble. Also, do not despise them. Despise means to look down upon, to scorn, to treat with contempt, to think lightly of or have the wrong ideas about, to care nothing for, to disregard. To despise them means to consider them not worth our attention, not worth our attention enough to take our time and our trouble to turn aside to them, to not view them as important members of God's kingdom. To forget about children would be like this, businesses forgetting about its customers, Doctors forgetting about their patients. It's like a body forgetting to breathe or an animal forgetting to eat. It would be like to plan our church's vision, our events, our services without asking what can we do for our children. We have to be consciously aware of their involvement. Why shouldn't we despise them? Well, one of the reasons he gives is because they're angels. Could be a potential argument for guardian angels. Their angels always see the face of my father. Before anyone has access to God, it is the children. Jesus is dedicated to their salvation. He's dedicated to them being rescued in a fallen world. And God is not willing that any should perish, but all to come to him. So what am I saying? I am saying that we need to do whatever it takes to foster this connection, as long as it falls within the New Testament and moral rights of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. How can you help? Well, you could teach a class. You can volunteer to update the room so we can teach effectively. You could bring your children to church, which is very, very important. You can volunteer at a school for a mentorship program. As parents, you can take the responsibility of leading by example, studying about Jesus, teaching them about Jesus, and not leaving it up to just the church. You could write a check to the children's ministry fund so that you can make the children's ministry as best as it can be. You could support to offer to send our students to camps and retreats. The challenge is simply this. What are you going to do as an individual to model a lifestyle of humility and service to our children? And it is involved in ministering to them. Here's our key phrase. If we want our children to be connected with Jesus, we must give them ownership on our family and treat them like they matter. We must give them ownership. You're a kingdom worker. You belong here. You matter here. That's what we must do. Now Jesus says this. Children, their angels are always before the face of my Father. And we're going to wrap up with this third point, that if children are always connected to God, that we need to be committed to children. This is so funny, okay? Matthew 18, Matthew documents Jesus schooling the disciples on what it means to be a servant in the kingdom, right? Being humble like a child, taking on their nature. And then the next chapter, right? This is what's so incredible. And I'm like, wow, if the apostles or the disciples could do such an ignorant thing, what am I doing that's so ignorant? And I want you to think about that, right? I think about this for me. He just schooled them on, on a message of what it means to be in the kingdom and how important children are. And then Jesus is teaching again, and look what happens in, in Matthew 19. It says, On one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. What? That's like a face palm, you know what I mean? That's an epic fail. What are you doing? <laughs> he just taught you and how important the children are in the kingdom. He just gave the child the place of honor, and then you're going to turn around and say, don't bother the Messiah with these little children. You need to take them away. He's more occupied with the important stuff, which is us, right? He needs to teach us. He needs to lead us. He needs to show what it's like to be an authoritative member in the kingdom. This is adult stuff. Get these little children out of here. And I can just see Jesus' face like, I can just see his eye. You know, like a woman, like your wife or whatever, angel, she'll give me the stare. You know what I mean? Or she'll bat her eyes like, are you even kidding me right now? And I can just imagine Jesus doing something like that, like looking at his disciples like, are you serious? I just taught you and you're going to go do something like this? It's, it's incredibly hilarious. That's what I like to picture Jesus doing right now, but, you know, that's not in the Bible. And so look at verse 14. It says, but Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed their hands on their heads, and he blessed them before they left. In Mark 10, Mark actually includes that Jesus was angry with his disciples. And Jesus didn't get angry very often in the New Testament that we have documented. Only a handful of times, and in this moment, he is angry with them. They were thinking children don't count. 
they're not important in the kingdom process. Once again, the disciples have misplaced what it means to be a part of the kingdom. He says, suffer them not. Do not hinder them. Don't make it more difficult than it already is. And it causes me to think, what barriers am I putting between children and Jesus, either consciously or subconsciously? What am I doing inadvertently that's causing children not to be able to have a direct path to Jesus? I don't know. It's something that I want to think about and pray about and meditate on because it will be worse than to have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown to the bottom of a sea than to cause a little child to stumble or to be despised or to prevent them from coming to Jesus. And I think, I would dare say this, that I think the best way I can make sure that that doesn't happen is to be the least of all, to be a servant of all, to sacrifice and give because I know If I am walking in the place of humility, serving others, that God will put all the other pieces of my broken life together. So what's the best way to model to children? It is this, parents, grandparents, family members, have a Monday through Saturday faith. Simply showing up on Sunday morning will not get the job done to your child. It will only teach them an ignorant and misunderstood view of the kingdom, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Do you know parents are the number one influencing people in the lives of your child? Whether or not you want to, want to understand or agree with that, you are. Whether or not your kids want to admit it, you are. Research shows 65% of teenagers will not participate in premarital sex if they have open and honest conversations with their parents. That's high because 75% of high schoolers have sex before they leave high school. The number one determining factor for your children to remain sexually pure is for you to talk to them about it. Number two, drinking. The number one determining factor for underage drinking is parents who are not involved in their child's life talking to them about it. If you don't want your child to get drunk and do something stupid and violate scripture, have an open and honest, judgment-free conversation about consuming alcohol and what that means and what that looks like in the context of Christianity. So with all of that, to simply end with this, why are children so important to God? Because he says, of such are the kingdom. Not these little sinful rascals who have been sinful and terrible from birth, but of such are the kingdom. We need to have the conscience of imperfection, to be unprejudiced, to be submissive and impressionable, to be unhypocritical, and to delight in pleasing our creator. That's what it means to be a part of the kingdom, to be like a child. Let me say that again. To be conscious of our imperfection. To be unprejudiced. To be submissive to be impressionable, to be unhypocritical, and to delight in pleasing our creator is what it means to be a child in the kingdom of God. And if we do not go back and turn to become like children, we invalidate our ability to be a part of God's kingdom. And this is what I love about children, is that their faith is so simple. It's simply this. I love Jesus, and I want to live for him. That's that's why God loves children so much is because they make it simple. We make it complicated as adults. We say, I've got to get my life cleaned up. I've got to stop doing all this bad stuff before I can become a Christian. And that's the exact opposite of New Testament Christianity. You cannot make yourself good enough in order to become a member of God's kingdom. You have to recognize that only with God's power, only with God's Holy Spirit, can you become the person that he wants you to be. I was talking with a young, uh, young girl, five or six years old, and she wanted to be baptized. And her, uh, the reason why she wanted to be baptized is because uh, she didn't want to go to hell. And five or six years old is really, really young. And her parents, of course, counseled her, listen, you're not going to go to hell. You're, God loves you. You're in God's kingdom. Um, but yet she was, she was convinced that if she did not get dunked underwater, that she was going to go to hell. And so they wanted uh, the church to partner with them, um, come over and, and talk to their, talk to their uh, daughter about um, salvation. And I am fully convinced, after studying the New Testament, as we read this morning, that children are of the kingdom of God. And she, she said, Mr. Rick, I don't, I don't want to go to hell. And I said, well, you don't have to worry about that. And we read some Bible passages in Matthew 19, Matthew 18, that children are of the kingdom of God, that you're connected with God, that if anything bad happens to you, you get to go to heaven You get to be with Jesus forever. You don't have to worry about going to hell, right? And I told her, I said, you know, even your conscience right now, um, Romans 4.15 says, where there is no conscious awareness of law breaking, you're not held accountable for the law breaking. That would qualify for children and those who are mentally retarded. 
that if you're not fully consciously aware that what I'm doing is wrong and it's violating God's word and I am a sinner, then God doesn't hold you accountable for that. And that's what we teach here at Seven Christian Church, that children are already a part of the kingdom. And so as we were talking about this, she said, well, I just want to follow God. And I said, well, do that then. Follow God. Pray to him. Serve him. Love him. Read about him. Worship him. You are a member of the kingdom. You belong to Jesus. And it is so comforting to know that parents who have lost their children, babies who are aborted, to know that they are in the presence of the Father with the ability to be fully aware of their creator, to know they're a part of the kingdom, is one of the most beautiful things that God could ever do. And I'm glad that he has done it because children have suffered in this world. And I can imagine God like a father being up in heaven as he sees his children suffering, his heart breaking. You know, I'm going to confess something to you. Yes. So I was uh, clipping Piper's fingernails. And as a husband and a father uh, who is not attentive to details, I was on her thumb and I accidentally clipped off like part of her finger in the front. It was like one of the worst experiences of my life. I cried, first of all. I will admit that, right? I cried like a little baby. She was in so much pain. She was so upset. You know, we were freaking out. Uh, I, was, I was freaking out. I was upset. Angel was crying. And the amount of pain that I felt by, by my child being harmed and in pain was almost just too much to bear. And it gave me a little glimpse of how God must feel whenever his children get hurt or a stumbling block is put in their path. And I wanted to do everything that I could do to make her little finger okay. And she's okay now. If you go look at her thumb, you would never know. But it really upset me. It really, it really caused me a lot of pain, especially her, poor little thing. And I just could have just punched myself, you know? And, you know, the truth is, is that you, if you're a child or if you're an adult, you are God's child. Hebrews 12, 9 says, God is the father of your spirit. He is your father. And some of his children have wandered far off. And if you're an adult, even if you're a teenager, and you're here this morning, and you know that you've violated God's word, you know that you have messed up, be humble. Admit the fact that you need help, that you need God in your life. And the Bible does command that those who are consciously aware of their sins, we call it believer's baptism, that they should repent. Unless you become like a little child, unless you turn away and repent, and that you should be baptized in water, in Christian immersion, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that God doesn't want to see his children go through pain. He doesn't want to see his children stumble. And the best way to prevent that is to be a follower of Jesus. God cares about your children. God cares about you. God cares about your family. And he wants the best thing for you. And the best thing for you is to submit your life to him. I'm going to ask that you stand. We're going to pray and sing a song of invitation. And if there's anyone here that wants to give their life over to Jesus, we invite you to do that now. God, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. God, thank you for being willing to use a uh, arguably um, worthless person like me who doesn't deserve your love or your forgiveness. But God, you love us. We are your children. And you don't want to see us walk through life in pain and discomfort and unhappiness, Lord. You want us to be happy and have life to the fullest. But God, sometimes the only way to accomplish that is to turn back the only way to accomplish that, to move forward in a relationship with you, is to get on the right road. God, I pray for the person in here that has been convicted by this message, that may be wanting to obey the gospel. God, I pray that they would do that. They would do that today. They would do that urgently. God, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving children and for loving adults, for loving the whole world. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.